you very much for coming. Um, today we have a discussion round, like a panel discussion uh, on German startups. So what, what is the current climate in, in Germany with startup companies? And uh, I'm very lucky to have a, a very great panel here from Germany, actually. So uh, first of all, we would like to start with a quick introduction. Uh, then we will go through uh, around 30 minutes of time with, uh, with, with an overview of how the market is in Germany and, and the climate. And then we will move on to uh, questions and answers. Uh, so to start with, uh, my name is Carsten Klein. Uh, I'm a, a risk consultant. So I'm based in Japan. I work on risk management, operational risk management. So I advise companies on uh, data and process optimization, cyber security, but also regulatory requirements. Uh, now I pass on, please, and yeah, if you could introduce yourself then. Sure, so my name is Oliver, Oliver Lubosch. Um, I'm from Mdigit. Um, we're providing an ABI platform for um, banking, fintech insurances to enable them something like um, open banking, PC2 integration, building ecosystems for fintechs and the collaboration, the integration of banks and fintechs in the German market. So we are a young company and um, at the moment um, at a uh, size of 20. Hello, my name is uh, Gilbert Gartner. I'm working for a German uh, media company um, which has a venture fund, so I'm a venture capitalist. We do early stage investments in the German speaking region. Um, we have around 15 investments, in the, mainly in the fintech and tech area, but also in education and health. And uh, we are, as a disclaimer, we are invested in both of those companies, so um, uh, if you have critical questions, don't ask me, please ask them. And yeah, very happy to be here, and thank you, Nikai, for the invitation. So, hi, my name is Oliver Oster, I'm one of the founders of Optopay. Um, actually, I've started my first company already with the age of 14 and so I developed and programmed uh, websites, sold subscription models. With 18 I found a second company, import goods from China, sold them online, uh, did this uh, through my whole studies. So I studied law and um, so I'm an admitted lawyer at the Berlin Bar and um, started also next to my studies a technology company for providing feedback at the POS. Um, uh, so I worked a long time in, in Frankfurt, Sydney, and then moved to Berlin uh, to start with Marcus together at Octopay. And yeah, happy to be here, and thanks for the invitation. Thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Marcus. Um, I started my entrepreneurial career in high school, actually, so I incorporated my first company um, at the age of 18, uh, it's called Rebuy.com. In Germany, it's the leading e-commerce platform for pre-owned goods. Um, roughly about 600 employees, um, over 100 million turnover, and um, about 50 million in venture capital raised. And uh, I've always been an active business angel in Germany, so I've done over 30 investments in Germany. Um, uh, a lot of them didn't work, so uh, I've always been, I think when you speak about startups, you also have to speak about failure. So um, uh, many of those cases didn't work, but a couple of them worked out well. So I invested into the biggest food delivery company, for instance, in Germany, which IPO'd um, in Amsterdam um, after it was acquired. And um, besides that, I've done a lot of uh, fintech and insurtech investments recently. And as Oliver mentioned, uh, we're both founders of Opturepay, uh, 50 people in Berlin, um, and we're specialized on disbursements. So we process payouts for companies. Um, and we offer uh, a variety of payout options. So um, we have over 120 uh, payout options that have a higher value. So imagine you get $100, then we offer you to take $120 at a shop, um, um, a fashion store or e-commerce player or whatsoever, and thereby you can basically make more out of your money when you get payments. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, from from the startup market, uh, like we see now, like we based now here in, in Japan, and so there's quite a big interest in, in Europe and uh, the, the startup community there. We, we saw now, like uh, yesterday at the, the Fin Summit, there were already uh, presentations or, or pitch. Uh, there was a pitch round already uh, where quite few European companies were presented. 
Um, so could you tell me, please, what is the current climate in, in Germany, like from the startup perspective? Is it like, is, is it very uh, strong growth? Is it like, no, because, for example, we see like the UK, like with, with the Brexit, how did it affect the position of Germany in, in, in Europe, like in, in the startup world? So, now let's... When I started, um, I think we have, uh, with the growth in the German startup and fintech market, I think it was quite strong and some years ago, um, and um, it still keeps on. I think we have positive effects in this um, international um, 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 relation. So uh, with uh, Brexit, and I think um, due to the um, common market in Europe, it's um, quite um, attractive to start from the biggest market in Europe and um, try to launch uh, the rest of Europe. We have, um, with the common market, I think, quite good chances. And I think um, the, the development is still there um, and there are some um, changes in those developments, some new um, scopes. So I think we started at the beginning quite strong with B2Z models. We're now stronger and more and more getting into the B2B models. Fintechs um, collaborating with banks, um, fintech supporting banks, um, and there are still strong dynamic, I think, in the German market. So, if I could um, estimate, I think we have now some hundred, three hundred foreign fintechs in um, Germany and um, good growth. Would you like to? Yeah. Um, so, I think the, the German startup market, I think, is very mature. Um, um, it, it, they have a long, learn, a long learning curve over the past years, maybe not as big as the US, uh, but definitely a major player. Um, fintech, um, in, at least in Europe, in Germany, has a very strong position. Um, but uh, I think you also have to view like the whole ecosystem um, that is important. So we see a lot of highly educated and uh, um, people um, quitting their uh, day jobs and starting companies. Um, it has become socially um, accepted. It has become accepted by also other companies. Um, it's important, um, then I think the ecosystem is very, very healthy. Um, corporates open themselves uh, to startups. Startups can work with corporates. Uh, there is uh, a lot of venture capital funding in, uh, in Germany. Um, so the ecosystem is, is, uh, is good, it's growing, and I think at a very healthy state right now. So, yeah, in terms of the ecosystem, I would definitely say in, in Germany, uh, corporates, they woke up and uh, started realizing that they do, that they have to do something in the digital transformation process. So for instance, they started a lot of accelerators, hubs, and corporations, uh, as what Oliver mentioned before. And everything actually started five years ago, or six years ago, when uh, number 26 started. It's um, really an online bank. And they started with delivering an interface so like a really um, user-friendly and with a nice customer experience designed app for, for providing like banking features. And uh, actually when they launched, um, they had like a beta version and people um, bought like subscriptions on eBay to be one of the first persons who have this app. So actually people bought to become a customer uh, at eBay, like a pre-subscription model. And so there, like banks and especially the financial industry realize that there's something happening and that we need to, to look into the needs of our customers. And uh, banks started first and uh, really analyzed the whole ecosystem, looked into the fintech industry, or and especially also in e-commerce uh, itself, and looked into how are actually the people working. So what is the working methodology? Are they working with Scrum, with Kanban, Agile methods? And um, they tried to adapt like step by step and uh, open up by that those kind of hubs, accelerators to really to try to adopt. And after that, uh, actually the endurance industry uh, tried to um, do the same. And they are still in a, in a, in a, in a long uh, and uh, really um, like, um, intensive uh, transformation process. Yeah. It's going step by step, and you, if you look into the market, you see that the disruption of, for instance, number 26, who went out of the on the stage 
and uh, kind of screamed out loud that we are disrupting banking and that you're losing your customers and in the end uh, like all of you will kind of lose your jobs if you're not doing something against it and this was really really interesting how to see how everyone woke up and started really um, and doing something in this whole digital um, digital process and transforming uh, like the whole entity structures uh, how is actually the hierarchy how is like the working methodologies and um, this is actually what I've seen over the last years that this is like a fast process now and uh, quite common that corporates are actually adopting those kind of transformation processes. Yeah, maybe one more perspective from an educational level so um, we have a tendency in Germany that a lot of uh, high-class business universities um, really focus on also shaping entrepreneurs um, so um, there's a culture of not going into banking or consulting but rather really starting your own company after university and um, I think that's another dynamic that basically accelerates the startup ecosystem besides the corporates going in and you know those general developments yeah, and for sure like this maybe one one to add people are helping each other so looking into the ecosystem so if you if you start with your product and uh, you look for like test customers and everything how is actually your what is the product market fit and you find a lot of use cases test um, customers and uh, you can easily try if this uh, product is uh, right for the market and then easily adapt and especially on the education level so if you are coming from a university which is like highly focused on building up entrepreneurs uh, it's also an ecosystem again and it's like a trust circle so people are helping each other with intros connecting people to each other and by that the whole ecosystem is working because everyone is contributing uh, to it and uh, especially also uh, in, in terms of investments uh, if you look into uh, investments you see that for instance the, the founders who actually um, made some money by selling shares that they are reinvesting the money into the ecosystem and uh, by that you are kind of um, building up a stronger and stronger ecosystem that's why actually um, like cities like Berlin are heavily growing and uh, this is like really really good for the whole society because we are building up um, uh, in, like in digital um, digital country as well maybe just one that I think it's a very interesting topic so uh, what Oliver is mentioning um, if you're in a certain circle uh, for instance uh, you know in the, in, the, in the German fintech scene it's very easy to get an appointment with a CEO of a bank because someone knows him and has a trust to him so you get introduced and um, you basically as a startup can get very high um, corporate contacts and um, like Oliver said it's very common within that fintech scene for instance in, in Germany that you help each other right um, and, and that creates dynamics and I think at the end it makes sense for both parts so also for the banks it's not only benefit for the entrepreneurs they're very open too. I mean, they. I think they accept a little bit that um, the small dynamic fintechs can bring the innovations into their banks, so they're using that technology. I think whenever happens something new, um, banks first invite other fintechs to screen what happens there, what are the latest versions. So they're really also benefiting from it from the ecosystem. And most of the new models that we have in the banking apps from banks or in the internet um, there are components from fintechs actually and that's the way how they get more attractive to their clients collaborating with um, fintechs which are faster to develop um, new things like account aggregation categorization and all these things so if we have a look at these new front ends much of them were developed from um, from fintechs and now they also make their product offering richer they decided well, we as a bank, we do not want to offer everything. I mean, um, we cannot get into each lending product, we cannot get into each investing product. So why can't we add like an ecosystem, the products from the fintechs in our offering if they are addressing a niche that we cannot address? So banks also profited from these um, technology-driven niche players. So I think it's a win-win situation for all parties.
And those were very good points, actually, like you, you raised with the ecosystem. Uh, for example, in, in Japan, we also see that universities are much more interested now in, in, in startups uh, and, and also have uh, courses where, where students get introduced to, to the ideas. But traditionally, it's still, I would say, it's, it's still a little bit, it, it takes more time probably. Uh, also, if, if you see in Asia, it's, it's self the mentality to start up companies is still different. But now, as we can see over the last few years, uh, it, it really boomed now, it, it's, it's, or it starts to boom. Um, but the, the points you raised, for example, with the access to the uh, uh, CEOs or, or like the corporate uh, leaders, that, that, that's a very uh, strong point actually, like in Germany, I think, because in Japan it's probably still more, more difficult to have this access actually for startup companies. And yeah, yeah. so it's maybe one, one uh, I just want to mention one thing. Um, actually, also the CEO also have interest into what's happening in uh, in the startup scene. So actually, just giving you a good example. Uh, so yesterday, the CEO of AXA uh, Germany was uh, at Optopay and uh, visited us for one day at Optopay. So we have a concept to to have like guests who are like working with us on a, in a collaborative way for one day. So they start at 9 in the morning and leave at around like 5, 6. And uh, so they are working in all departments from product, sales, marketing, and tech. And they're looking into it like how are we actually working. And um, I don't know if you have those kind of programs here in Japan, but this is really interesting because now if, if you do so, then you realize how are they actually working? Are they like working uh, just on ideas, or are they really delivering products? And this is everything. Like this is all. Like if you look, go into the top management, it's it's often that people don't really know how efficiently people are working in startups. Like what kind of products, in what kind of a speediness we are actually delivering also those kind of products. And uh, this is also what Oliver mentioned as well. Um, looking into customer experience, startups can easily adapt fast to the needs of customers and can like develop fast products and also um, develop them and distribute, test, and then measure and again build them from like maybe invent them new so that uh, they are kind of uh, that you have in the end a really great product. And um, maybe the customer needs are shifting in two to three or years, and uh, corporates sometimes need two to three years to decide what kind of product are we actually now developing. And um, their startups, and especially in the corporation model, can work well because uh, we can adapt fast and then deliver fast products, and by that can also fulfill the customer needs. And that's all about in the end. So maybe um, one more word on the. I think it's also important to see um, it on a on a on a time frame, an evolution perspective, um, because especially in fintech, where you deal with um, money, uh, a lot has to do with trust and uh, also market performance. So um, 20, 20 years ago, probably fintech would have not been made possible. Um, so if you go to a German. Um, um, Client, a German customer, and tell them um, instead of handing your money with Deutsche Bank, some startup is going to handle it. They would have told you, "Are you crazy? I'm, I'm going to go with the big banks. I have to trust. I have um, my grandmother had an account there. My parents have an account there. Um, uh, this is safe. The money is safe there. It's a big brand." Um, so, but parallel, what happened was that um, that first of all, the banks were not innovating enough. Yeah? They were still relying on the old business models did not bring in new innovative products. And the second thing that happened was that the market performance um, is really, really bad. Yeah. So for your savings account, um, currently you get uh, almost negative interest rates. Yeah. So you're losing money every day when you leave it with the bank. Um, so with, with those two um, situations in the market, not being innovative and bad market performance, something happened. And it happened that customers, both um, end customers and uh, corporates, started trusting younger companies. 
they started trusting them with actually with their money. So you have startups in the in the in the savings area and the deposit area and the wealth management area and the financial analysts, whatever you whatever you, like you name it, and um, they are they are they are giving them um, access and they are trusting them. And since some of them are pretty successful, then the corporates woke up and they realized, okay, the customers are not trusting me the same way as they did for the past 40 years. I'm not innovating enough, so I have to open myself. Yeah? So it's a, it's a bit also of um, saving themselves. Yeah? Um, because in Germany, I think now we have the um, we have three digital banks now in Germany, I believe. Um, so um, I think that was impossible 20 years ago. Now we have three new digital banks with, with full banking license, and customers are trusting them. Yeah? I think that's a big, big deal. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a good point with the licensing, like in uh, for example, from the uh, like to, to start a new bank, often it's, it's very difficult to, to get a license, to get approved, but also uh, to actually put it uh, at an earlier stage, even to, to incorporate a company. So how is it actually in, in, in Germany, if you want to set up a company, just a company, is it like, for example, if you see the scale, we have, let's say, uh, UK or, or yeah, Hong Kong maybe where this is a very simple or, or very easy to set up a company uh, compared to Japan maybe where you have the extreme case where it is quite difficult to set up a company. Where would you see Germany basically and, and how long would it take for example like if you have a startup company how long would it take you to incorporate as a company? I think uh, it, it's maybe not as simple as in England but it has gotten a lot simpler so um, you know we have the GmbH um, which is basically uh, not liable, right? Uh, in, in the sense of the limited company, company. limited, yeah. And um, they have a smaller version of that, um, which is very basically easy to implement, very fast. So I think that's not a barrier in Germany to open up a business is easy. Um, I think in in the in the context of fintech, the more interesting part is the regulations around um, BaFin uh, or the financial authorities that control the banks. And there you do have a, a very secure environment in Germany in the sense that you know you as a private person are protected and there are high entry barriers. And um, often I hear that fintechs are saying um, it's too hard. I actually have the position that I think it's not that bad. There's maybe some improvements to be done in Germany to make it more transparent to entrepreneurs what you are allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. I know Baffin is working on that, um, but um, I think that it's, 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 it's for the entrepreneurs to solve this, right? And the good thing in Germany is we have an infrastructure of banks that actually serve or give banking as a service to startups. So number 26, the example that Oliver mentioned, when they started, they didn't have a banking license, but they had a backbone bank that provided the infrastructure and all the regulatory um, necessities and they just built on top of that a product that is customer facing. And um, there are many possibilities like that in Germany and I think there's at least three banks, four banks that I know of that um, are able to provide an infrastructure to a startup to basically build any product. Lending, retail banking, credit card whatsoever. So I think that uh, in Germany it's a very good environment to you know, um, start a company and get also the regulatory things in place to launch the product. So, so maybe that's the positive side, yeah? so that startups can borrow the banking license from, from sustained banks. On top of that, with the, um, uh, with the EU passporting, um, it's, it's, it's possible for them to go into other markets. Uh, so vastly increased from 80 million to 300 million people. Um, but the, from the investor side, um, and also the challenge for the startup is um, once the regulatory hits you. Yeah? So right now they're borrowing the license and the whole regulatory stuff is outsourced to the bank. They, they have the big requirements and they have all the costs and they have all the processes and the startup doesn't have to deal with it right now. Yeah? So I think it's going to be an issue for a lot of startups and a big challenge once they want to become a full bank, a full banking license and have all the setup in-house um, uh, to bring the assets inside, that's, that can be tricky. Yeah. I, I agree. At the same time, I think that you know um, the regulator has an has an intent, right? He wants to protect, and I think there are certain things that actually a startup also has to make sure 
to be considered secure. Uh, and therefore, I think, um, because we're dealing with money, right, that's the industry we chose, and um, it's important to, you know, do this in a very responsible way. So I think, therefore, yes, the challenge is there. At the same time, it's necessary. And I think especially also with PSD2, um, PSD2 is like the new regulation which is coming in, 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 in Europe. It's like the same you have currently also in Japan, I think, that you have especially this open API banking. So this delivers like a great opportunity for, for startups actually to deliver customer experience products and really show banks or like the financial industry uh, that they actually don't need maybe also financial industry to deliver great products. Uh, if you are like B2C, like if you have like a B2C business and if you're requiring like the customers, I mean then you have classically uh, those kind of marketing costs and everything. Uh, and then customers will go more and more into uh, to those kind of businesses, like who are customer facing, and you will lose like customers as well. Um, on the other hand, it delivers like a great opportunity as well for B2B companies who are delivering great service, for instance, in a white label solution, to kind of speed up uh, the process of uh, delivering great products to your customers by easily integrating those kind of B2B service providers. And it's like always a question of a bank, do I want to uh, develop everything by myself? Or uh, do I want to be like the backbone provider and just connect me with different other um, services and uh, let others do the front end? And um, that's a big question mark behind it. Some bank is taking this strategy, other banks are taking that strategy. We will see in a few years what is the right strategy, I would say. And um, I think that was a big bang for the German market to having this um, access to accounts. So when we compare the German market to other European markets, we had the fact that we had standard interfaces so that fintech could access the account data of banks. There was a public interface for 15 years and there grew a kind of ecosystem of fintechs which worked with the account data, doing something like customer analytics, personal finance management, aggregating account data. I think there were um, first dozens and then later on hundreds of um, more than 100 fintechs just growing on this. And if you compare their Germany to other European markets, there was a big difference. Other markets were um, suffering that they could not directly address the client because they couldn't get the bank data into their um, applications. And with the German system, which was um, a swivet since the um, uh, 2000s, um, it worked. So every new fintech can provide with the uh, credentials of the client, the account data of a client, the portfolio data of a client. And this is now a subject of a new regulation, PC2, which is part of, the, of Europe and now coming to Japan too. And that was really a change and opener for our market especially compared to other European countries. And I also think that it will make a new share of roles in the market. So when clients can directly address, um, uh, fintechs can directly address the clients, it's um, really um, opening everything, um, opening up. So there are many new client apps, and that's how it works in, in Germany at the moment. And do you see also, like, let's say, for example, in, in uh, Singapore and the UK, you have the regulators, they have a sandbox approach. On one hand, you, you showed, like, German fintech companies can build up a system on the backbone of existing banks or, or providers, which is really great to, to get the experience uh, firsthand straight in the market and get also the client's data. But do you have, on the other, sand, uh, on the other hand, also kind of a... Uh, change of view from the regulators where they say okay on one hand we want to have it very safe we want to use existing channels but we want to change also to adapt to, to the fintech uh, world or oversight <laughs> uh, so i think the the sandbox environment made it easy to launch bigger banking models in the uk and other markets and we could see in the German market that we did not have that huge number of new neo banks, like for example in the UK. So there was a bit difference. 
but um, as we said before, um, I think we were able to handle this with the uh, um, new fintech bank that we have that we use um, to, to manage and run the products. Um, so um, at the end, it's, um, it's, it's, um, it's okay, so the situation, um, to have the um, same um, level field for banks and fintechs um, in Germany and not giving them advantage with the sandbox environment. But um, yeah, but at the end, well, I mean, um, the, the German authorities are not really service providers um, to, um, to, to fintechs. Mm -hmm. So they have strict rules, but they open it to make it easy for fintechs to follow them. Mm -hmm. It's feasible to follow them, but they're not kind of servicing them. So um, it's like um, if God decides the next day that there is a new regulation, a new rule, it will happen. So no discussion with fintechs or limited discussions, it will happen. So they're not services. But um, yeah, at the end we can work with them and we have a very um, continu um, stable um, regulatory um, environment and that's um, good to handle. And I think the number of fintechs in Germany um, makes clear that it works out that way quite well. Uh, how do you see actually in, in, in ex say, let's say in the UK you have many like London as, as a center for, for fintech and like uh, let's say in, in Germany now you have like Hamburg, you have Berlin, Frankfurt and, and Munich. So and whereby Frankfurt is like has this, this center like of this finance center. But how do you uh, work on this one because even from geographically it's, it's like there's quite distance in between, but how does it work actually? How do the eco centers in, in those regions like do they specialize in certain uh, products or certain areas, or is it kind of they work all together? On so, maybe from the from, again from the historic point of view, um, so Berlin is just probably the startup center in Germany. Um, why is it the startup center? It's it's pretty strange actually because it's a it used to be and still is a very, very poor town. A uh, very very poor region. Uh, poor but the, sexy. <laughs> actually, the slogan of the city is poor but sexy. But okay. um, very little industry. Yeah. So actually, if you from, if you approach it with an educational view, um, it would be crazy to choose Berlin as a, a startup as a city. But what happened was that it was very cheap. Um, it was a cool city. So young it was a tr young people were attracted by it which means also good talent was attracted by it, which is very important, yeah, because uh, it's easy to, f um, to found a company with two, three people, but when you have to grow and you have 30, 40, 50, 100 people, where do you get the talent from? Um, and Berlin was very attractive. Um, so Frankfurt, for sure, is a, is a fintech space because all the big banks, big players, financial industry is located there. Um, Munich um, uh, is because we have a lot of insurance companies in Munich, large insurance companies. Um, yeah, and so different cities, uh, different um, uh, different access to the whole ecosystem. Yeah, I think in Berlin you also have no like miners, you have no industry really. Um, a lot of big companies are not uh, they have no company seat in, in Berlin, and de develop like Berlin developed by the people who are living there actually, and uh, everyone was kind of. Uh, in this mood to develop something which is a bit more against everything and that's how every like kind of the whole e-commerce system started in Berlin. The whole ecosystem started really from the people and still the people are living there. That's what I mentioned before. The people are now investing also more and more into the ecosystem again. And uh, I mean we both coming from Frankfurt moved to Berlin to start our business. Uh, this is a good explanation actually because it's like Frankfurt is a financial capitalist city in, in Germany and maybe also in Europe uh, next to, to London and um, but it's it's not the uh, for instance it's not an issue to, to live in Berlin it's more we are profiting from it because especially corporates like managing directors CEOs I mean they know people from Frankfurt they know how Frankfurt is working they know how Munich is working but like Berlin is still for them a bit un, 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 undiscovered. They they need to discover it. They need to get to in touch with the people, with the ecosystem. Everything is going really fast in Berlin, and um, you have a lot of interesting people there moving to Berlin. And looking into our company structure, for instance, we have like 23 nationalities in our country, and. Uh, 
how is it possible to get so fast people from Ukraine, Japan, China, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, just the best talent? It's really hard to get them into another city instead of like Berlin. Berlin, everyone wants to move because it's easily it's easy to order your coffee at a coffee store shop in English. It's really those kind of small uh, things actually which makes life easier. So you go in Berlin, uh, you can easily speak uh, English with everyone. Everyone speaks English, and uh, also some friends of you might live in Berlin already. That means, for instance, if I'm from Brazil and I'm moving to Berlin, um, I can maybe crash a couch of friends and, and sleep there and find a job in Berlin. And it's, it's not possible, for instance, in Frankfurt, Munich, also like in, in London, I think. It's just possible in, in Berlin that you're crashing couches of your friends, searching for a job, and uh, start your or start your own business actually in Berlin, and this is what Berlin uh, makes a great city because everyone is not judging and is helping each other in terms of let's build some great products and let's start like really great uh, e-commerce businesses. Yeah. Your one part actually to to round up maybe, or actually two parts to round up. One is. Um, like from from the startup scene, which particular trends do you see now? Like, what, what are the, the kind of hot areas right now, and where you see like potential over the next year or two? Or, yeah, because normally we cannot go too far. Like, like, uh, like, do you see any particular trends where you think it's maybe unique to to Germany or uh, in in general? Maybe yeah, I mean, PSD2 has been mentioned, um, so um, I think that's a huge potential, you know, that it gets easier to get data from the banks and to build products on top of that. I think that's a very European kind of German thing. And then I would say that B2B is definitely, is, is kind, of, uh, kind of crystallized that, you know, they have higher success chances, um, as it is still um, not so easy to compete with the big banks um, in a B2C customer acquisition. The customer acquisition costs are high, so to find someone to open up a bank account takes several hundred euros, um, customer acquisition costs, and often startups have difficulties in pre-financing such customer acquisition costs against a lifetime value that is uncertain. So I think that the trends are definitely B2B and things that build on data that gets uh, accessible through banks. Um, I think that the financial industry um, in Germany, but also in, in Europe, actually worldwide, uh, is going through this exact same process what um, uh, uh, retail commerce or e-commerce has done 15 years ago. Um, it's the exact same digital um, disruption. Um, people are moving away from the traditional brands. They're moving digital. Uh, they want better, faster services. So I think it's the same cycle what they had 10 years ago is coming out of the financial area. The positive thing with the financial area is that um, it's such a vast market, it's so it's so huge, the numbers are so big, and since most of the time it's a transactional business, in theory you make money with every single uh, transaction. So that's a very um, interesting and lucrative um, way to look at it. Um, so I think the financial industry has a very, very long way. Um, I think. Um, we are just touching the surface of what um, the services and products to, to, we can digitalize. Um, and I think the biggest trend, although I haven't seen any business model yet, is definitely going to be some application on the blockchain technology. Um, uh, and we're all waiting for the first startups in that area. Yeah. So, yeah. So, also, like, Marcus and me, uh, we are investing a lot into companies as well. Uh, so, we believe also in this whole. Uh, industry so from my 15 investments 11 are fintechs so financial technologies uh, for me also one of the rising uh, stars and i mean for sure we have prop tech companies in the real estate business med tech which is really um, really rising as well uh, legal tech um, but the like let's say the most money is in the financial industry so that's uh, also uh, the biggest potential in my, in my opinion. 
and uh, from there, also if you look, if you, if you look uh, a bit above, I would say um, we can do uh, if we um, kind of disrupt the financial industry and um, made everything more digital, we can extend step by step the value chain. Uh, why shouldn't we put like advertisement more and more on top of our financial services? Why we shouldn't uh, add like uh, prop tech um, services on, um, on top of our service? So step by step extending the value chain. If, if I look into the endurance industry, uh, I mean, uh, they picked also some parts of, of banking, banking industry because they've seen, ah, oh, okay, this is like a profitable business. I'm just extending my value chain and adding these kind of services. Uh, we can also look into more medtech maybe as a bank or as a, a insurance company. I think there is coming something up in the next years uh, because there is a lot of capital capital in the market, and uh, we can invest it really carefully and. Uh, um, and um, definitely into extending value change and uh, in the end always delivering a great customer experience and making his life as easy as possible. And I think this is something really important. Yeah, so I would also totally agree that um, of course um, the digitization means I'm absolutely disrupting the value chain um, and that means of my point of view like Oliver said, that a bank doesn't have to produce every product by themselves, um, that they can use others, networking, integration, ecosystems, are, I, think, I think, are getting more and more valuable. I think banks will have to accept at the end that they will not always be the front end to the client. They are just um, one option that I can go to the brand, which is quite rare meanwhile, that I could use the website, but more and more often I use tools, partner products, and I want to find embedded loan products, embedded investment products. So the value chain is more and more disrupting, more um, um, digital companies, um, client-driven companies are having the contact to the customer, the digital contact. So um, that's some banks really will find new positions to be the platform and a kind of um, um, mixed structure, so products from different fintechs, com combining product from different fintechs, integrating in the digital channels of different digital players. I think that's, this will be kind of the new picture. And, you know, and I, on a quite basic level, I think what also is coming um, more and more in Germany is um, the focus on corporate banking. So we're um, quite strong and um, discussing um, the, the um, private banking um, or the private customer as client. And now we find more and more elaborated products on the lending side, financing um, 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 the projects of, of, of companies, doing the accounting for companies. I think that's quite a strong trend in Europe and Germany too, addressing the um, underbanked segments of small and medium enterprises from um, fintechs. And yeah, of course, I totally agree with blockchain. And with regulation, um, as you mentioned it, I think will be the time to see more and more bigger fintechs. So, they get used to how the regulation works, and they get used to how to get a bank or how to get regulated, and they're able to raise more money so that we will see more new banks, more new banks with very specialized products um, directly addressing the client. Yeah, maybe one more, I think, trend that you can see, especially in corporate banking, is um, kind of the function of an aggregator. So you have a lot of products on the market, it's intransparent. Um, what the best offer is for you. For instance, if you're looking for money as a corporate, you want to lend money or you want to finance something, um, there's a vast portfolio of products. And um, just like in e-commerce, I think the analogy is great. You can look to the past, what happened there. Marketplace has created uh, Amazon Marketplace, one of the most successful trading platforms where you have one stop and you know you're going to find a solution for your problem in the sense of buying something. Same thing is going to happen with corporate banking. There's going to be aggregators. You say, okay, I'm looking for 1 million euros, I need it in a week, and I'm willing to pay a maximum of this interest rate, and then those aggregators will find the best solution, may it be a fintech or a bank, um, to solve your problem. I think that's a trend which you can also see in, in, in Germany, you know, that those aggregators are being created. One last uh, question actually is, from like for example in Japan with startup companies the the initial strategy is normally 
uh, I get very strong in Japan, I take advantage of the, the, the strong Japanese market and then I might expand to, to Asia Pacific or I might expand to, to, to the US market. How do you see it in Europe? I mean obviously Germany is from that point uh, like similar actually because it's quite still even in, inside the EU it's, it's like a close market, it's, it's, or it's, it's quite a rich market for, for companies to make business and then with the EU passport obviously you can access Europe but what would be like in general like what kind of strategies you see like the successful uh, startup companies or when startup companies try actually to expand? I think it's, it's, it's different, there's no general approach, but yes, I think it's similar to Japan, we are in the, in the lucky situation of having a very strong domestic market, so I think that in tendency, uh, German startups focus on the German market first, uh, we have the advantage of the European Union, um, also with the ZEPA, in the sense of you know clearing payments um, and having a harmonized infrastructure, so it's not that far away to go to the next step, but I would see it maybe in between uh, Japan and maybe smaller countries like the Scandinavian countries, for instance, where you know the domestic markets are so small. Spotify, for instance, they had to think global from the beginning on, and um, yeah, so it's maybe in between. I would I would agree. I think it's very it can be dangerous that um, if you if you plan your business model or your company based on that you have to um, uh, reach. A certain amount of markets or countries in a, in a, in a certain time frame. Um, I think Germany itself or even Japan itself or UK and, um, by itself is a large enough market for I think a lot of business models. Um, I think on the uh, in the financial sector at least on the B2C side when you look at savings, debit, credit, uh, uh, maybe wealth management, um, those processes are pretty universal. Um, uh, the needs of the customers are the same everywhere. Um, you, you should handle money, you should handle it where well, it's very the same way you also address and sell your product. So I think they have the potential to, um, to expand into other countries. Um, I think it gets a lot more complex when you do B2B or when you do um, more complex structures of services or products. Um, and there I will be very cautious um, of entering new markets because um, it could also f fire backwards, it can be very slow, it can also uh, tear down the whole company, uh, um, the development of the whole company. Um, so I would put a lot of thought into that. So I think also to be pre precise, if we want for instance go as a German based company, as a B2B provider, service provider to, to Japan for instance, to Asia, uh, we can't do it without help. Uh, I mean, building up a company with no market experience, with no network, it's quite impossible actually. So we need people, we need like, uh, we need actually founders, entrepreneurs, corporates who actually have an interest in having this services and uh, helping us with uh, integrating into maybe the first bank, first endurance company, uh, and then can, and then we can also with the local. We can't do it, for instance, by ourselves. We need like a local who's, for, like, who's here in the market. And I speak uh, not only for us, I think for all B2B service providers, uh, uh, that we need then locals for kind of developing also uh, in terms of like uh, culture um, fits. We need like help and understand how is actually, for instance, the process, the general process of integration of uh, like communication working and um, then you need like people to to develop with you today together uh, the, the product in the market because actually you have also maybe some diversities uh, in, in the product maybe you need uh, in terms of different regulations you have to adapt your your, your back-end systems uh, you have to adapt maybe also um, your 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 general process of integration, and uh, that's that's uh, a challenge. Uh, but uh, I think also, if like Japanese companies are coming to the German market, they have also to face it. Uh, but there is a great opportunity. We just have to uh, create a, like a good exchange and having maybe programs to kind of educate each other to make those kind of things happen. 
Here's nothing from, from um, our side of AC and Digit versus which is doing um, API platforms and um, ecosystems. We are technology driven and for us it's a bit the same. So the more technology, the more attractive it gets to be international um, because um, the differences are not too big. But um, of course, um, it needs to be localized. So I think with um, growing fintech markets, the players will get bigger, they will get more international. Some have to um, focus on the um, um, on the local gaps, um, but they will uh, get reduced. Um, and I think um, in, in a future perspective, uh, fintechs will be more and more um, get a global um, point of view. And especially if they are technology driven like in our market. Yeah, thank you very much for, for all your insight. It was really great. And we have now 10 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, are there any questions in the audience, please? Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, one question that I'd like to ask is how you see Japan market? Because as a user of the fintech company, we see plenty of US-based companies coming into Japan and also UK-based companies. And obviously, there's a lot of um, local players as well. But we don't see not many German players here right now. And how do you see Japan market? That's, that's a super interesting question. I, I think. Um, it's a really difficult market to enter. So you have even longer processes as in Germany in terms of due diligence, communication, uh, and it's uh, it's for us a big investment to to go into this market. And therefore, we need to be sure um, that um, we have a, a certain infrastructure to kind of uh, and especially also like investment kind of uh, enter the market and be, the, be there for a specific time. I mean, we see it also in Germany that like, if you enter fast the market, then at one point you maybe don't have even more cash and then you're running out of cash and then you can't integrate because the sales cycles are so long. And uh, I think in, in terms of like, for instance, why are so many US companies or UK companies coming into the market? Um, they are more aggressive, I think, uh, and uh, having more investment and just saying, we go into this market and uh, we will conquer it. And uh, from, from our perspective, we are a bit more, like let's say, we're going step by step. We first like look into the German market, into the European market, and then if we see opportunity to go into the Japanese market, then we look, okay, is it possible to go into it? And um, yeah, that's maybe one of the differences. I think another reason is maybe that, um, especially in the US and UK, there's um, people from Japan studying there. Um, and they go abroad to the US and, and the UK um, and get educated and understand both cultures. And that's maybe something where uh, in Germany there is some potential that um, you know we have People who understand both worlds and thereby can, you know, translate um, everything culturally, business-wise, language-wise, to enter the market. And I guess this is what we're here for, right? We're we're here to build relationships, um, to accelerate this, and to bring more of the ecosystem from Germany to Japan uh, in a collaborative way. And 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 yeah, this is why this is a great happening. This is why we're so happy to be here uh, to accelerate that. I think definitely also vice versa. So I think Japan had, was not on the on the map in Germany as a as a fintech country. Um, now we're here. We've seen that you have a lot of good good companies, big players, uh, very interesting markets. So that we are definitely going to take it back and educate the German uh, scene um, about the market here. And uh, but I think it has to be educated on both sides. Uh, um, and more talks have to come and more collaboration. But um, we will definitely take something back. Also, like there was like one, there like already like two investments of Japanese companies uh, in in German fintechs. So there there is a visibility, I think. For instance, SBE Group invested into Solaris Bank, it's a beautiful backend provider, and also Rakuten invested into uh, Simple Insurance. So 
I think uh, there is a great possibility to work together. Uh, we just have to uh, take it step by step and um, build up, as you said, like these relationships. Any other questions from the audience? Hey, thanks very much, Gareth Allen from Bloomberg. Um, might be a little bit off, off topic, but um, we've seen uh, recently that um, Germany, in particular Frankfurt, uh, has been a major uh, beneficiary from the Brexit moves, uh, particularly with, with Japanese companies. We've seen Sumitomo Mitsui, uh, Nomura, Daiwall announcing that they're going to open up offices in, uh, in Frankfurt. Um, with uh, this influx of, of financial, big financial firms into uh, the city, what uh, opportunities do you think that um, offers for small startup firms uh, like yourselves uh, with, uh, with the big Japanese uh, financials? So actually my, my brother, he started his company, also the first company in, in Berlin, uh, and then the second, he moved to Frankfurt. Um, it's called Clark, it's also like uh, for in, in, in the insurance sector. The, the, the problem in Frankfurt is that it's really fragmented. So you have like the one startup is sitting there, the other startup is sitting here. It's really difficult um, to to consolidate them and also that they are helping each other. I mean the ways are like really fast as well to, to banks and to uh, insurance companies. Um, but it's actually, in, in my point of view, um, why are all the corporates going to Berlin to make those kind of startup safaris and look into this ecosystem at Berlin? It's they want to see like what is Berlin doing, and they don't want to really see what like Frankfurt startup companies are doing. So this is like one difference actually, and um, it's also so much easier to build like an international uh, um, um, employment structure. I mean we have so many nationalities in our company, and looking into um, other companies. In Frankfurt, for instance, um, it's usual to speak German in, in the company. We speak just English in our company. So we're building everything up from scratch in English. And um, I think um, also in terms of Brexit, I mean, the, the government of Frankfurt, they hired a consultancy company to build up a whole structure. So the problem is if some a third party is building up a structure how to uh, how to make like an ecosystem? Then it's not anymore an ecosystem uh, because an ecosystem has to build up by the people, and that's the major problem I think, which has Frankfurt. But for sure, in, in terms of like higher financial industry, banks, insurance companies, they're benefiting from the Brexit. If it's happening in this way, then for sure the real estate prices will benefit from it for sure. We have one last one, a very quick one, because uh, we nearly. Thank you, uh, thank you for the invitation, and uh, thank you for speaking today. Um, please talk about how difficult it is for foreign companies to get into the German market, a U.S. company or a Japanese company, a small company, not a large. Um, yeah, I mean, you have the language barrier. For sure, but I think uh, in, 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 in the sense of um, how many people speak English in Germany, it's um, rather a positive country from that perspective. So, um, and depending on the region, um, it is actually very um, easy to hire English speaking people. So, um, on a grade level, frame me from 1 to 10, 10 is very easy. Um, I would say it's somewhere in 6, 7, um, so a little bit above average. Um, and, and, and there's also a lot of support, so there's a lot of um, basically um, also companies, but also um, non-commercial um, foundations that focus on supporting um, the entry into Germany. So there's really an infrastructure to give foreigners shortcuts um, to open up networks. So therefore, I think it's, it's a positive environment to get in. It's a positive environment. Um, if, if you look also, there are coming a lot of companies um, from London uh, already to, to Berlin, mm -hmm. especially, and uh, building out their companies there. And you only have to make sure that, for instance, your product integration team or your, your sales team speaks, in, uh, speaks German. 
if it wings to German sales. So, but it's easy to find German, like uh, German-speaking people. So, uh, if the management just speaks English, and you have also like uh, CEO meetings, every CEO in, in Germany speaks actually English, and it's easily to have those kind of conversations in, in English. So, uh, I think um, that's a great plus actually. So just one more thing, I think finding local uh, talent uh, is doable, setting up the company is doable, that's all fine. I think the biggest issue in Europe and also with the UK is going to be um, how do you handle cross-border immigration. So um, that's a big issue, so I think there's going to be a huge shift now from uh, depending on how the negotiations work out, but the Brits at some point probably have to leave, which is super sad, and we cannot um, work, very, work very easily in, in Britain anymore. And I think for Japanese or US companies, it's, it's the same. It's still very difficult to get local job permit. So you have to find the talent locally. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And yeah, really enjoyed. Thank you.